I'd like to welcome Reed Hunt to Knowledge at Wharton today. Reed is the CEO of a company called Coalition for Green Capital. That's a nonprofit corporation. And uh, I think the title suggests what it's about. But he's also formerly a chairman of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, that was in the mid-90s under uh, President Clinton. So I'd like to start out asking you um, about your ebook, which is titled Zero Hour, Time to Build the Clean Power Platform. And you write in there, you have an interesting provocative first sentence, I thought, which is that modern life rests on two electromagnetic wave platforms, knowledge and power. The power platform is where the knowledge platform was in 1993. Uh, would you explain the thinking behind that? So you're suggesting that where we were with computer technology and that sort of thing uh, back in the early 90s is where we are with uh, the power platform or green energy, perhaps. That's exactly right. Uh, let's go on a little uh, time travel trip, at least in our imagination. Uh, take with you on this trip your uh, phone or your computer or your television set and go back 20 years and it won't work. And that's because the communications platform of 20 years ago has been completely overhauled. Analog to digital. Everything that was analog is now digital. That's true for television. That's true for cellular phones. All the standards for all the communications equipment. Everything is completely different. How did that happen? One trillion dollars of investment in the United States in about 10 years, roughly 1995 to 2005. We completely rebuilt as an economy and as a society the knowledge platform. Who made those investments? Oh, those investments were made by lots of different people. Um, some of them became very, very rich. Some of them lost all their money. Uh, one thing we know is that that tremendous wave of investment increased uh, the average income for every quintile in the American economy. It's the only decade since the 1950s in which every quintile in the American economic ladder has seen its income go up. So economically, it was a very good thing. Uh, and of course, for productivity gains and for changing life as we know it, it was very, very good. What I'm saying is that it, we're at the exact same starting point with respect to the other electromagnetic waves, those that give us electricity. So this is very interesting and provocative. Um, and I think that one of the key things that, that you talk about in the book and, and one of the key ideas about how to get from here to there is the, this idea of a green bank. Is that right? Yes. Uh, you know, what is a bank? A bank takes deposits and it makes loans. A green bank would be a bank that gets money from somebody and then loans money out to clean energy projects. Who's the somebody? Well, uh, in the case of the states where our nonprofit is now working, the state of Connecticut, the state of New York, the state of California, the state of Vermont, the state is contributing capital or planning to contribute capital to a green bank. And then the money is being loaned out. In the state of New York, they just loaned out several hundred million dollars to private investors who are putting in even more money for a total of about a billion dollars of capital to go into clean energy markets. So the idea is that the state, which I guess could be on the federal level, couldn't it? But right now we're talking on a state level, would invest money, um, and it would either make money or break even in this bank, presumably. That's it. So there's really, um, at least over the long term, no cost to taxpayers, perhaps something initially, um, but that that money would be paid back. That's exactly right. Uh, okay. So, but it takes the government to participate because. Why? There's no profits at first, and so there's no interest by any company to do something like this? Is that the idea? Uh, not quite, uh, but here are the reasons. Uh, reason number one is uh, most clean energy projects are unfamiliar to most commercial banks. They're not in the business already of loaning to people for uh, putting solar panels on their roof. Uh, they're not in the business of loaning to a community to build a community solar farm that maybe isn't very big, uh, but would serve a, a town or, or, a, or, or a small city. So they're not adept at evaluating what the risks they might be yeah, in those they don't know how. They, they just don't have anyone on staff that mm -hmm. does risk analysis. Uh, and number two, uh, since the uh, Great Recession began in 2008, 2009, 
Uh, many, many banks have worried a great deal about their own balance sheet, and they've been averse to taking on risks in l lending. Uh, so that's further inhibited their willingness to get into clean energy uh, lending as a, as a category. A third problem is that many clean energy projects are kind of small. You want to put solar on your roof, and maybe it's a $20,000 project. A big commercial bank would say, you know, that's a home improvement loan. That's not the kind of loans we make. Go somewhere for a home improvement loan. But when you go somewhere for a home improvement loan, they don't consider solar on the roof to be a home improvement loan. All this can change, but if we want to get the clean energy markets growing quickly, and we do if we want to deal with climate change, then the state wants to step in and say, well, I'll just kind of nudge it here at the beginning, but I'm not going to do anything unless the private sector is going to join up with me and provide a lot of the money too. So think of the state or the government as being the leader but not leading too much, uh, just getting in, in, basically getting in the water and saying to the commercial lenders, the water's fine, come on in. That's what we've seen happen in Connecticut, which is the oldest uh, state green bank. It's three years old. And we have found that for every dollar of state lending, we attract about $10 of private sector lending. And how many dollars in projects have been committed so far? In Connecticut, in which Connecticut. is not a very big state, right, it's, right. About, so, uh, it's almost $300 million. And that's for 3 million people in the state. And what kinds of projects um, is this Green Bank funding? This, uh, what, is, what is this 300 million funding? Uh, two things in particular. One is what we call the whole building overhaul. Uh, that might be a strip mall uh, where they put solar on the roof and they exchange uh, the windows, single pane windows for double pane windows. And maybe there's a fuel oil boiler that's replaced in, in you know, some central location. So it's a whole building overhaul. And then that lending is put on the tax bill uh, by a provision in the state statute. And as I said, the Connecticut Green Bank will make the initial loan, but later the private sector will come in and be part of the lending structure. So the building becomes more valuable, and the occupants pay a lower amount for electricity, and eventually the taxpayers are made whole. What's, what's the break even on something like that? Um, in other words, at what point? You, you mean how many years? Yeah, do, you, do you pay back the loan, and then after that you're actually quote unquote, making money by saving money on energy? Well, uh, the Connecticut Green Bank doesn't make any loan unless the net present value of the savings is greater than the amount of money invested. Everybody at Wharton knows what that means. Right. It means you have a net present value positive number at the very beginning. Otherwise, we don't put the money in. At the beginning. At the very beginning, it's net present value positive. Now. Uh, the payback will vary between four and seven years, meaning the cash out will have come back in that right. time period. Right. And then after that time period, it's all gravy. Okay. I think that's a financial term, gravy. <laughs> you yeah. asked me what projects, that's, a, that's right. probably our number one example, okay. but the number two example is distributed solar on residential rooftops. Um, did, were there any other um, efforts to, to promote solar on rooftops taken. I'm just familiar with uh, complaints about in the U.S. in general compared to a place like Germany that there's just a lot of regulation that slows down uh, the ability to get, get these things rolling fast, which is what you're trying to do with the funding. Did they do anything about regulations in Connecticut? Yeah, we have been trying to uh, slim down the permitting process, which can mm -hmm. take a long time right. and can cost a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and we do that through a project called Solarize. So the Connecticut Green Bank goes to a town and it says to the mayor, if you promise that you will expedite the permitting process, then we will loan money in bulk to everybody in your town. And then the mayor says, that sounds like a pretty good deal. If I cut the red tape, I get some of the green. And we say, that's absolutely right. That's interesting, because I know in Germany, a, a permit can take two or three days, I think, last time I, I looked. Right. And here in this country, I think the average is months. Uh, Germany in months. Germany uh, was ahead of the mm -hmm. United States and pretty much every other uh, country in, in the Western world in terms of expediting permitting. But Germany made, and I say this with respect for their motives, Germany made a big mistake in solar, which is that they decided that the way to grow a solar industry was to have a guaranteed price that was very, very high, uh, called a feed-in tariff. And the problem with that is 
you're, the government is buying the electricity and then giving it to the consumer at a lower price than the government is paying, mm -hmm. that's a buy high, sell low strategy. Mm -hmm. That's true in governments and in business as a way to eventually go out of business. <laughs> uh, so that's not what we're talking about in Connecticut. We're talking about in Connecticut and in the other states, what you said earlier, making the taxpayer whole, having the consumer be getting cleaner and cheaper electricity. So this is uh, innovative financing in, in the positive sense. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But it's, you know, not unusual. Uh, governments play a big role in financing roads and bridges and public schools and a host of other facilities in the social landscape. So having governments extend their role uh, to a modest degree into changing the energy platform of the United States from carbon and expensive to clean and cheaper, I don't think it's asking governments to do something unheard of. And I can't help noticing the parallel between what happened in the IT world, which is that it was actually the government, jokes notwithstanding, that invented the internet um, and uh, you know provided the basic uh, research that, that, that led to the internet, as it, as it does in lots of areas, like, like uh, medical research, pharmaceuticals, and all that. A lot of the basic research is paid for by the government, and then companies come in and figure out how to commercialize. You know, in the IT world, I would say that uh, you can uh, credit or blame the government mm -hmm. for two big things. Mm -hmm. Number one, as you said, the initial research into the technologies that ultimately gave birth to the internet as a commercial phenomenon. That initial research was paid for by the taxpayer a long time ago. The and, Defense Department, wasn't it? Yep. And when the taxpayer was paying for that research, the taxpayer, you, me, and everybody else, we didn't really have any idea mm -hmm. what would happen, and neither did the experimenters who were doing the work. That's the first of two things. Mm -hmm. The second thing was done during the Clinton administration, and here's what it was. <laughs> The government decided that the internet could borrow the existing infrastructure, the telephone network, for free. And so the early days were that you would unplug your telephone line from the back of the device called the telephone, mm -hmm. and you'd plug it into your computer at no charge. There were a bunch of other regulatory measures like that, but the collective decision in the Clinton administration was Let's let the existing infrastructure be used by the usurpatious, revolutionary, change-oriented new technology. That's what we need to do in energy. We need to have the grid be borrowed for free by the distributed solar people and the other new technologies. Let's say we did that because, look, you, you talked initially about how much change has happened in, in 20 years. So let's fast forward 10 or 20 or 30 years ahead with clean energy. What percentage of U.S. energy do you think uh, could be uh, uh, delivered via green methods, whether you know, alternative methods, whether it's wind, solar, water, you know, whatever it might be? Okay, well, hold on to your hat, because actually I've spent a lot of time crunching the numbers with people. If the solar, distributed solar industry today is about 1% market share of energy, it's reasonable to think that that can double every 12 months. Doubling every 12 months month. gets you to a very big number in 10 or 20 years, mm -hmm. very, very big number. It's also reasonable that the wind uh, sector in the United States can be ultimately about 20 to 25 percent of the total energy sector. You put those two things together and the majority of all electricity in the United States can be made by the sun and the wind. And um, that's within how many years? Um, it depends on how uh, right. fast growing right. uh, you actually mm -hmm. think it all could be with the appropriate right. array of state well, green even banks. Even, let's say, a, a mid-level scenario, right? Oh, I would say a decade. A decade. The reason that a decade it, it could be the majority of electricity. Is that right? Right. And electricity provides what percentage of our power? Well, uh, a good way to think about it is that transportation is about a third, and all the rest is some, some electricity used in some particular way. Okay. So, for example, electricity is used in industrial processes, right. or it's used in uh, lighting, or it's used in some cases in heating. So, there's lots of ways that electricity 
mm, sneaks into uh, the usage patterns, but more or less transportation is a third or 40 percent, and the rest is driven by electricity. And even that transportation could be largely electric, right? Well, if we if we really wanted to, right. you know, tell an optimistic story about electricity, mm -hmm. which I think we should want to do. Uh, then I think that what the way to think about it is that in about two and a half years, when the electric vehicles that come into the market will be priced at around forty thousand dollars, then you'll see a tremendous increase in the percentage of annual vehicle sales that is attributable to electric cars. So this is, seems so much more optimistic or quicker than the kinds of numbers that you usually hear. It's time to be optimistic. Uh, uh, a lot of things have changed in the last three or four years that have given rise to optimism. One is an 80% drop in the cost of solar panels. That should give rise to mm -hmm. optimism. Uh, the other thing is the innovative business models by solar installers and by other clean energy companies. I do want to say this. There is one fundamental obstacle, which is the existing energy industry is carbon-based and the existing energy industry is not going to be a big huge winner if the clean energy industry substitutes for its role in the economy that's that's what happens in business somebody wins and somebody's place is taken uh, how do you, how how would advocates of green energy overcome that huge obstacle uh, consumer demand uh, there are two ways to overcome it. One is you get the government to tell everybody, thou must buy clean energy. Mm -hmm. mm, if we have to to deal with climate change, I guess we might have to imagine that. But there's this easier way in a market-driven economy. You delight the consumer. Mm -hmm. You please the consumer. You make the consumer clamor for the better deal. Mm -hmm. If I went to anybody in the United States and said, could I just give you uh, electricity that is cleaner, Anyone's going to say, yeah, but does it cost more? Suppose I say it's cleaner and cheaper. Mm -hmm. Who's going to say no to this? And this is what's very doable, is what you're saying, even on a large scale. It's totally doable on a large scale. It's the secret of Solar City, just to give you an example of a company. Solar City, could you just give us a brief? Uh, well, Solar City sketch? is the uh, rocket ship story of solar installers, but it's being emulated by other uh, companies all across the country. and. I'm like a lot of other Americans, I opened up an envelope at home just last week and it said, would you like to meet somebody from Solar City because, you know, if you have a high enough credit score, we'll give you clean electricity off your roof and it'll be cheaper than you're paying from the grid. This is not a bad offer. Could you give us um, just a, a, a quick idea of what you thought about the U.S.-China climate agreement? It's a historic uh, agreement, and there are two reasons. Uh, reason number one, when the President of the United States and the leader of China, President Obama and Xi, have a handshake understanding about reducing carbon emissions tw by huge, huge numbers in less than, well, in about a decade. When that happens, the two countries, the two economies that are responsible for 40 percent of all global emissions have taken a step farther toward the necessary clean energy future than any other country or any other region of the world. That's a really big deal. Now we are leaders with China and everybody else should step up in every other country and match our promises. That's reason number one. Reason number two, what the president said in Beijing is that the United States would increase its goal of cutting emissions by 50 percent over the previous stated goal. In other words, he's now saying that in just 11 years, we'll reduce emissions by 27 percent approximately. It's a very, very big number. It puts us down a very ambitious path, but one in which it actually is possible for Americans to have cheaper and cleaner electricity.